Hi, welcome to Tilt Shift. I'm Tim. I'm Brian. And we're going to be looking at a film trilogy that is kind of a follow-up to a trilogy we did in our last season. That's right. In the first season, we did Jura the Jurassic Park trilogy. This time, because we knew the third one was going to be out this time, we were saving it for season two. Yep. This is the Jurassic World trilogy. More now, dinosaurs, right? We've got to watch some dinosaurs. Yeah, I like the dinosaurs. Love it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the first two films are rated PG-13 for intense sequences of science fiction, violence, and peril. I love this specificity on I that, right? Nice job on that word. <laughs> it took me a second. I was like, eh, get <laughs> it out there. Yeah. <laughs> and then the third one is PG-13 for intense sequences of action, mm -hmm. some violence, and language. And uh, um, as in the first trilogy and as right. in a lot of these movies, there are things to watch out for and some other things that, uh, well, you should be watching out for all of them. Some good, dinosaurs some Dinosaurs in particular. Yes, but yeah. definitely but want to watch evolution, this kind of more genetic manipulation, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, right? and this one, they're sort of a soft reboot of the Jurassic Park trilogy. Yeah. So they're building off of the original trilogy, but in a way they're There's almost sort of remakes. Like the uh, first one and both of them are very, very similar, but now it's a much bigger, more sophisticated park. And, um, and better see. CGI. Yes, <laughs> they do get better and better. Uh, so this one, it follows two main characters. You've got Owen, who is played by Chris Pratt, and mm -hmm. Claire, who is by Bryce Dallas Howard. Yeah. And she was the one who ran the park in the first one, and we'll see. They play different roles as you go along yep. in the trilogy. Um, so um, let's take a look at our very first clip, because I want you to see how the film, the very first film of this new trilogy opens up. Oh, dinosaur, right? Oh my good heavens, look at that T-Rex. Oh, oh, and it's a bird. Or not. Oh, keep panning up, that's Wisconsin. <laughs> is it really Wisconsin? Yeah, it is Wisconsin. Oh, look at that, yeah. all right. Yeah, so the very first thing they're showing you is, oh, well, dinosaurs and birds, they are connected because it's a common theme throughout all the movies, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, was, that was a big theme, especially mm -hmm. in the third one when mm -hmm. they, with the Velociraptors. But it was throughout the whole original trilogy, and there's a lot of it in this one as well. Uh, so if you don't think that's what they're really promoting, right. well, let's take a look at another clip. This is from the third film. Wow, this day. Uh, which, which pod are we? Are there um, dinosaurs in the mines? There are dinosaurs everywhere. I mean, you know, technically birds are dinosaurs, gen gen genetically speaking. Okay, Lewis. Um, Grant and Sattler on this pod. We need to send a security okay, team out there. Absolutely, ASAP. Ramsey. Thank you. Uh, let's all just stay in our lanes, though. We can. You love that, right? So, it kind of off the cuff comment, off to the side. It wasn't the main focus. Hey, but dinosaurs are everywhere because dinosaurs are birds, genetically speaking, which is the assumption of evolutionists. But we know it's not true in reality, uh, both genetically, actually, and biblically. Yeah, isn't it that um, technically they've reclassified birds as dinosaurs? Sorry, does he say technically birds are dinosaurs? So, right. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, so that yeah. does match the modern conception of right. them. Right, if in you the just past, classify that, things by name in a certain way. Right, right. so the, yeah. and when they say genetically speaking, well, there are a lot of things that are genetically similar. We're genetically similar to plants and so and We share half aspects. our genes with bananas. It is the same. We are the same. Yeah. So, so well, you are kind of bananas, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we, people are bananas, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when they're crazy. <laughs> You know, the whole dinosaur to bird connection isn't really even based on genetics like these films promote. The genetic studies came about a long time after that assumption that dinosaurs and birds are related. That idea goes back to Thomas Huxley like in the 1860s, and he was the first one to promote the whole dinosaur to bird relationship, and that was influenced by his evolutionary worldview. So the issue doesn't really depend on genetics. It hinges on how the words dinosaur and bird have been defined and redefined. So, th yeah, that's a man-made classification system where they decide he there's enough similarity between mm -hmm. these genetically. We're going to classify them in the same thing. But you could do that with a lot of different stuff. So and you, genetic similarity doesn't demand evolution. That's what they'll propose. So that means there must have been a common ancestor from which these things branched off and you get diversity over time, but you see similarity because of the ancestor. No genetic similarity equally, if not more powerfully, shows a common designer who made right. us with the same stuff, right? Because God created this world and we share this planet. We mm -hmm. eat, sometimes eat the same foods. There right. has to be certain similarities in order for those things exactly to occur. Right. And so, again, if you're still not convinced that's what they're pushing, take a look at the Pyroraptor from the third film. Yeah. Is that a Velociraptor? No, this is Pyro. Peacock a Veloci chicken? <laughs> There's some feathers on that guy. Oh. 
I love how he has a knife. <laughs> Better than nothing, I think. Uh, yeah, but you know. Good luck with that. No. Nope. Oh, that's not good. I think Pyroraptor is good at swimming. Man, impressive. And she's also really strong. Yeah, <laughs> she just yanks him out of the water. Yanks no him out of the water. That's hard to do. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. so that's Pyroraptor in this new film. And mm -hmm. what's, what's interesting to me is when you look at the fossils that these things are based on. So in the first Jurassic Park trilogy, you got Velociraptor in there a lot. They have them a lot in the second one. Yeah. And they make them like six feet tall. They're a lot scarier. But as far as we know, Velociraptor got about this tall. Right. You know, they weren't very big. Well, they had to be six feet tall to open the doors. Oh, that's right. right. They had to be able to open the doors. <laughs> and they're a lot scarier when they're taller. They actually based it on a different dinosaur, as we talked about, I think, sure. at that time. But in this one, what did they actually find for, for Pyroraptor? So they've got just a couple of bones that they found. Uh, it seems like one down by the ankle, and then they've got, mm -hmm. a, like, the claw on a couple of feet. Yep. They've got, like, a, a vertebra or two, and then they've got, like, the couple of arm bones. That's all they got. Nothing with feathers. And from that... They make this creature that's way bigger than what they actually found because, again, that's more like the Velociraptor, a lot smaller. comes up to, like, a, the knee height on a shorter person, yeah. not even on me. Maybe, like, a, the shin on you, right? <laughs> Maybe the ankle. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they make it way too big so it can be scarier. Yeah. And then they give it feathers. Is there any evidence that it could swim, Brian? Not that I'm aware of. I think they may attribute maybe something to like a webbed feet. They may make that argument, but again, trying to pull that from the fossil record, that would be almost impossible to do too, depending on what you actually find. And so a lot of just, there's a lot of evolutionary ideas poured into those findings to try to reach those conclusions. And when you find that fragmentary evidence, it's wide open to interpretation. And that's what we often say here at the ministry, that understand that the battle isn't over the amount of evidence. Everybody's got the same evidence, but mm -hmm. your interpretations, your worldview that, bring, that you bring to that evidence that determine how you interpret what you're looking at in the present. And that is what really is the foundational issue. Now, some of that they're doing it by, if you can say like guilt by association, or they're classifying sure. because what they've done is they take this, this group of of, of creatures that are, have been classified as dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And so they have uh, the dromaeosaurs or dromaeosauridae. And they bless put, you. Thank you. <laughs> and this is a chew. Oh, bless you. <laughs> they, have, they have pyroraptor in there, they've got velociraptor, and microraptor has also been put in that group. And they assume that since microraptor had feathers, then these other creatures must have had feathers. Well, we work with a paleontologist, Dr. Gabriella Haynes, and she spent a lot of time on this subject. She said that there's no reasonable explanation not to classify Microraptor as a bird. So just because some people put Microraptor in a category that includes dinosaurs, it doesn't mean that it was a dinosaur or that it should be seen as evidence that dinosaurs evolved into birds or that dinosaurs had feathers. And so that's the thought process behind that. Mm -hmm. And even if, and we've made this point before, yep. Let's say that there was a legitimate fossil of a creature that really truly was a dinosaur and it clearly looks like it had feathers. Does that mean that birds evolved from dinosaurs? It would not mean that at all because <laughs> we see all sorts of creatures today who share similar features for different unique purposes, if just not for beauty, right? right. Or for whatever God may designed it for. So it doesn't demand that one evolved from the other because they may share common features. But again, the evidence is really scant and it's wide open to interpretations. Right. And, and God could have made them that way if he yep. wanted to. He, yep. He's not held to the standards of what we think he has to do. Right. And so a lot, one of the things I say a lot of times, the best evidence for evolution is in the artwork. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It is that true. is true. Or in the CGI, I guess you could say. And it's, so it's compelling or convincing yeah. for people. But um, when we look at uh, one of the things in, that, that has been discovered lately... In 2005, uh, that's not really that lately anymore. Wow. <laughs> it's 18 Almost 20 years, years ago. Good yeah. night. Oh that's crazy. Yeah, anyway. 20 years ago, it was supposed to be like I was still in high school. But no, that's <laughs> more than 30 years ago already, which is really that's weird. That's creeping further and further away. <laughs> yes, Especially is. for you. But <laughs> that's <laughs> well, true. Well, a couple years behind. Yeah. <laughs> so, but in 2005, Dr. Mary Schweitzer found soft tissue in yeah. the upper leg bone, the femur of a T-Rex. And for creationists, this is something that, you know, several creationist ministries are like, hey, check this out, because we were told this stuff can't last for 10,000 years. So that, that's a big deal, right? And understand when we say soft tissue, we're talking about it's still pliable. 
Yeah. It's still stretchy. There's still some elasticity to it where you can pull the spring back into place. Sometimes there are blood vessels and red blood cells still intact in this tissue because uh, we found soft tissue again and again now since it's we know right in other dinosaur it, bones. Right in other dinosaur mm -hmm. bones. It's literally everywhere. And if it's the biblical paradigm, that dinosaurs lived not that long ago from creation, roughly 6,000 years ago, but the evolutionary worldview, this stuff, this soft tissue should not exist. No, because they, we were told for a long time it can't last for more than 10,000 years. Yeah. So there it is. And yep. so what do they say? Well, there must be some unknown process by which these could be preserved for, for 67 million years in the case of this particular T-Rex. So the first Jurassic World yeah. film tries to offer an explanation, and it's a little bit, um, it, it's kind of hard to hear a little bit. It's the, the younger brothers telling the older brother, right. but the older brother's just paying attention Distracted looking at girls and that kind of thing. But, yes. So let's take a look at his explanation. <laughs> Soft tissue is preserved because of the iron in your dinosaur blood generates free radicals. Those are highly reactive. So the proteins and the cell membranes get all mixed up and, 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 and uh, act as a natural preservative. DNA can survive for a millennia that way. So now, even if the amber mines dry up, they'll still have bones. Shut up. To <laughs> he was staring a hole through that girl. <laughs> right. I mean, like, man, I, that was just creepy. <laughs> I just, if there's any young men out there watching, that's not the way to go about it. <laughs> and besides, when you're on vacation, you're going to see her for one day and that's it. Okay, don't even bother. All right. <laughs> but his little brother there, he's trying to talk to him and he's telling him, give him this explanation about how the soft tissue could have lasted for a long period of time where the cell membranes mix up with the other things and free radicals get all mixed together in the tissue, help preserve it, the iron increases, and it's what evolutionists do suggest today. So I, I did read some a paper right. on this to try to, I wanted to understand exactly what they're claiming. So what they're right. saying is that there was this, um, th they took, I think it was with ostrich mm -hmm. material, and they, they soaked it in a, like a concentrated blood mixture, which is not okay. what you're going to get in... It's not actual uh, natural circumstances right. or conditions, right? And then they put it on the shelf and it was able to preserve things for about two years. And they're like, oh, this is how it could be done for 67 million years. Well, I... I you probably understand two years is a little yeah. bit different than 67 Also million. not natural conditions that you gave it as exactly. well. Exactly. Mm. So uh, Brian Thomas, who's a friend of ours from uh, Institute for Creation yep, Research, he said this in his study about it. He said, while the study does show that iron helps preserve soft tissues, the results fall far short of the author's claim that this explains soft tissue persisting for millions of years. Concentrated blood and extra water may not approximate real conditions. Iron is not always present with known original tissue fossils, and the scientists did not pr produce a useful time to dust estimate for their iron encrusted tissues. And then not only that, it, even if you give them all they're asking for and assume their conclusions were correct, at best you're giving it thousands of years, but not millions. Right. But even their conditions probably are faulty as well. Right, because when that creature gets buried, it's not in the conditions where they're like a concentrated iron right. mixture where they're able to do this sort of, where they're trying to preserve it. Um, so I think what happens a lot of times in this debate is when you have a, a find like this where it's like, wow, this seems to really line up well with the biblical worldview and it is very much at odds with the way the evolutions have told us this is going to be. Yeah. They scramble to try to find anything. And what happens at the popular level, especially, yeah. people will jump on that. And they're like, oh, we've already answered that. How it can last for a second? Sure. No, you haven't. Yeah. But you've had one person come up with an explanation for how this might possibly sort of kind of give a little bit of an explanation and it doesn't answer the issue. It's easy to fool people when they're already fooling themselves. And I don't blame them for doing what they're doing. They have a worldview. They're trying to understand all observations through that worldview, right? And they should do testing to right? try to figure it out. No My problem. point is I want them to acknowledge you've got a worldview. You have a set of assumptions that you are believing, taken by faith, and you're trying to interpret things through that grid. And and because so we do we, too. We do too. So yeah. we want to point out the fact that you have that worldview and understand that you do and uh, try to be consistent with it, which they really can't be because it, real observations will actually go against their ideas, ultimately, and rightly understood. Which we see in genetics as well. And mm -hmm. the films deal a lot in genetics, probably even more so in the new ones than they did in the original right. trilogy. And in, in this, they kind of just throw it out there. You see some complex <laughs> diagrams of the DNA and everything. It right. looked complicated, but they make it sound like it's so easy. And so let's watch a clip from the first of the Jurassic World trilogy. The good news? Our advances in gene splicing have opened up a whole new frontier. We've learned more from genetics in the past decade than a century of digging up bones. So... When you say you want to sponsor an attraction, what do you have in mind? We want to be thrilled. Don't we all? The Indominus Rex, our first genetically modified hybrid. 
How did you get two different kinds of dinosaurs to, you know? Oh, Indominus wasn't bred. She was designed. She will be. Hmm. So there's quite a few things in there. Indominus right. Rex was designed. So this is the big bad guy in the first Jurassic world. Yeah, the main world. villain in the first of that mm -hmm. trilogy, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, she wasn't bred, but she was designed. Right. So it shows that they, they take great intelligence to make these creatures, right? Right. And then in this, if you think about it from an evolutionary point of view, somehow all of that just happened. All of that information packed into the DNA molecule. It just somehow happened over By random time chance, chance. accidents, time, space, and matter. Whereas the time. other view is an infinitely intelligent creator. God right. made us. Right. And what we've seen is it takes intelligence to create things that are intelligent. It takes life to create life. Well, I mean, real scientific observations confirm that all the time. Life only comes from life. Information only comes from a mind. Now, once you have information, you can make copies of it, but its origin is always from a mind. And DNA is full of information at a level that's hard to comprehend. It's so much more complicated than anything we can make as human yes. beings, right? And so stuff we can make, oh, that's designed. But something that's more complicated than what we can make, well, that's an accident. Right. Not logically consistent, really. No, it isn't. And the, the one guy recognized the problem right away. He's like, wait, how did you get two different kinds of dinosaurs to right. breed, basically? Yeah. And, um, so the problem with this whole hybrid idea, so in this one you have like part Velociraptor, part T-Rex, and whatever else they have into the, the concoction there. Um, the whole idea, we know that animals only bring forth after their kind. That's yep. what we observe. Dogs will only have dogs. Cats will only have cats. Presumably, tyrannosaurs will only have tyrannosaurs. I mean, right. it's not like we get to watch you know, study whether they're doing that today because they're not around, but yeah. the same principle applies. And in this one, it's just, it's kind of genetics, rather than being like this super complex process, it's like a little cut and paste approach where, oh, like we're going to take a little it. bit of a frog and we're going to put that DNA into Some here. Some cuttlefish here, a little frog there, a yeah, so whatever here. That, with the cuttlefish, oh, wow. that's how it can... So easy. It can camouflage yeah, yeah. itself, and then the tree frog, that's how it can regulate its temperatures and all those different things. Um, we, well, Brian, you and I work with a geneticist, Dr. Georgia Purdom, that's right. and, and we showed her this clip. <laughs> and what was her response to it? Well, this is a direct quote, all right? She says, the genetics in this movie killed me so bad. Like, all caps, all right? So bad. Yes, it was seriously embarrassing, embarrassingly bad. So unbelievable. So from a geneticist perspective, this is just... Terrible. Right? That's her that's, scientific that's opinion. Her, that's her very detailed, <laughs> analytical, scientific opinion of that, right? And, uh, so bad. Yes. I mean, obviously, she <laughs> could go through it. Embarrassingly bad, right? Yeah. She, could, she could give a lot more detail on it, but it was just like... That's a layman. Why, that's a layman why do you level. need to spend my time on it? It's bad. <laughs> um, but yeah. because you use big words, most audiences aren't going to... I'm not even going to understand a lot of it. I'll right. go and look up some of the things. But yeah, they're taking something that is exceedingly complex and trying to make it simple for audiences, which makes sense. It's a plot tool. Yes. Yeah. We understand that, right? Mm -hmm. But also it feeds into a bad ideology about evolution being plausible because this stuff is just easy. Just give it time, chance, and right conditions. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and even in the third film, you have like fixing genetic diseases. Oh, yeah. It's just pretty basic. Right? You can just study this one thing for a couple of days. I can fix the whole world. I mean, Wu know. is incredible, right? He can do almost anything. Yeah, except for we find out in the, in the third one, he's really not all that great because he had to borrow everything from a, a well, that's woman true. that we find out about that's introduced in the third film. Or maybe mention a little bit in the second one, I guess. Yeah. Um, so yeah, even in the, in the second one, the Indoraptor, they talk about how every single bone and muscle was designed for hunting and killing. So they use that design language and then, yeah. uh, and these ones when they're genetically modified, yeah, that's design. But then for the creatures that they came from, that they're borrowing the information from, yeah. evolution. And it's so interesting, too, if you happen to get into this genre and you start reading about evolution and creation and reading evolutionist literature about how certain traits developed over time, they'll often use phrases like, well, natural selection designed or evolution designed this particular trait. Evolution led to this. But evolution or natural selection doesn't have a mind. It does not think. It does not plan, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, they attribute these human features to non-human things to try to make it seem more feasible in our minds, mm -hmm. which is bad logic, right? It's a logical fallacy. And also, of bad science. Yeah, so in our next clip, we're going to, talk, we're going to see how they're talking about cloning dinosaurs and also Lots people. of cloning uh, going so, on. Yep. Well, one person at least. Yeah, well, for dinosaurs and then dinosaurs and then one person. person yeah. so. You okay? Did you say Beta? Is that her name? I gave it to her. Beta's pretty special. You know, when we made Blue, we used monitor lizard DNA to fill in the gaps in her genome. Monitor lizards can reproduce without a mate. So... Beta and Blue are genetically identical, and that's what they have in common with you and... Charlotte. 
What do you know about Charlotte? She died. A long time ago. It broke my grandpa's heart. So he made me. No, Maisie, actually he didn't. Charlotte made you. So we learn here that Beta, the little velociraptor there, yep. is a clone, even though that's almost a full size one in actuality. <laughs> in, real in the life, movie, it's yeah, a little yeah. tiny one. That's, um, a, that's helpful comparison, looking at between that and Blue, full grown in the movie. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. Uh, so she's a clone of, of Blue, which mm -hmm. is the main velociraptor in. The extra smart one, the one that empathizes and has sympathy and yes. has care for. But from the Owen, first two films right, in this, yeah, yeah. Owen has trained. Yep. Uh, but this one, hey, just add monitor lizard genes so that <laughs> to just fill that in the easy, gaps. Right? No problem. Cloning ha then cloning can happen. I mean, it's that simple. If I want to be taller, can we add giraffe genes and I just get taller? Is that we could add, we can extend the bone. <laughs> like we can cut and break your bones and then stick some oh, rods right. in there, but yeah, yeah. it's going to be uncomfortable. I'm taller. This is so cool. I may even have a future with the NBA. But Maisie learns that she's a clone in the second film. Yeah. Thinking that her grandfather did that because her mom dies in a crash or something like that. But that's not really the case according to this. Um, her quote unquote mom. Right. Uh, she's a clone of her. Of her and mom. She's the one who did it. Um, so Dr. Wu is the character we saw there. We saw him in the last one. He mm -hmm. kind of let himself go a little bit. I was just noticing. And like film two of the trilogy, short haircut, right? This and one, it's the all... First, yeah. And yeah. He's, he's actually back in the first original Jurassic Park, too. Yeah, he is. So all he's in back. several right. of these. But um, the, the, do, the films do raise some ethical considerations Absolutely. related to genetic manipulation, related to cloning. And um, so this one, you have uh, Claire and Owen at the end of the second one. They rescue Maisie, right. uh, and the, the three of them kind of survive together at the end of the second one. And then in the beginning of the third one, we have Claire and Owen and Maisie living together as like this unconventional family. They've kind of right. taken her in. They're trying to protect her. Because, because in the she's last like, movie, her grandfather died. Yes. Right, and so she's all... Was almost, killed. Yep. Yeah, killed, right. Yep. And so Claire and Owen, um, they're kind of raising her as like an adopted daughter, but not officially because yeah. she's a clone. What legal... Considerations of them. Right. So they're trying to keep her safe by not letting her go anywhere. And, and also, there are people who want her because she is a clone. The genetic information she contains will be helpful to what they want to do, and they're right. trying to get her for bad purposes. So they're also trying to protect Which her. Which is from setting those up the plot too. for this mm -hmm. movie. Yeah. Care of myself. Hey, it's okay for us to depend on each other. That's what people do. How would I know what people do? The only people I've spoken to in the past four years are you both. Besides, I'm not even a real person anyway. What? I was made from someone else. I'm not me. You were the only you who ever was. <laughs> I love that look. <laughs> too, like, oh, that came out way cheesier than you expected. Like, really? <laughs> that's what? That's the best you got? Yeah. Although it's... I'm having an existential crisis and you're the only you that ever was. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it is I mean, true. Yeah. Yeah.